to divide my talk into three sections. Uh, firstly, I will say a bit about the euro, uh, briefly. Uh, secondly, I will say a bit about the shifting power relationships in Europe. And thirdly, I will um, say a bit about Britain and its relationship with Europe. On the euro itself, I mean, none of us know what's going to happen. My guess is it'll survive um, for two reasons. Firstly, trying to actually organize its dismantlement. It would be incredibly complicated and would cause tremendous uh, chaos. Um, secondly, because the political leaders in Europe are very strongly committed to keep it going, uh, including, <coughs> crucially, most German leaders. But there are two reasons why I'm not entirely certain that the euro will survive. One of them is that we don't, that there's, an, there's an intellectual or ideological rift in the European Union about the nature of the problem. It's rather as if you have a sick patient on a bed surrounded by doctors, and the doctors don't agree on the nature of the remedy, sorry, the nature of the illness, or the, which particular remedies are needed to cure the illness. And that is the situation at the moment. You have, um, uh, you have the Germans and a few others, or the mainstream German view, which is that austerity and structural reform are enough to cure the Eurozone's ills, that moral hazard is a very serious problem and therefore um, uh, you shouldn't have too big a bailout funds or too, too generous bailout schemes or too much financial support, and that the problem is all about the deficit countries, that the surplus countries, such as Germany, are not part of the problem at all. And then on the other side, you have those who are more Keynesian in their approach, um, who think that too much austerity imposed too quickly is counterproductive, that it will uh, lead to such a, a, a decline of economic output that the debt burden grows and becomes unsustainable. This school believes that Germany is part of the problem because of the very peculiar structure of its own economy, being um, a country that consumes very little, relatively little, uh, that it imports relatively little, and has had low levels of investment. Um, and these, this school obviously thinks that, being Keynesian, that you need to think about more about demand, growth, and investment. And therefore, they favor more generous rescue mechanisms, schemes such as Eurobonds and so on. Now, these two philosophies have been battling each other out for the last couple of years. And I suppose, uh, if one is optimistic, one can see there will be a kind of compromise, that the Germans will have their fiscal compact, um, and everybody will sign up to budgetary austerity. But in return, the election of Sarkozy, perhaps, sorry, so of, so of Hollande, I mean, will um, lead to the Germans to accept uh, a greater emphasis on growth, in investment, and demand. And we can talk about how we do that, but it's, it's very hard. To, I mean, it's, there's, no, there's no silver bullets, there's no easy answers, but I guess you know, there's talk of project bonds, greater role for the European Investment Bank, um, using EU funds uh, to, to, more, to promote growth more directly and spend on infrastructure and possibly role for outside uh, non-European financial institutions spending money, money on infrastructure projects and so on. But that is the optimistic way of reconciling these two, these two rival teams of doctors. The second reason to be uh, concerned is democracy. And the annoying thing that people don't always vote the way they're supposed to vote and if we are optimistic and the doctors agree on the remedies required, um, will, can they persuade the people to follow them? Can Europe's leaders, if they think of the perfect scheme to save the Eurozone, can they get everybody to support it? And I do worry that a referendum in one country or a parliamentary vote in another or a general election in a third could mess up the schemes to save the Euro. Um, and uh, obviously you, you must be thinking about this in Ireland with your own referendum on the way. Um, and uh, as far as I can see, if the Eurozone survives, there will be more centralization of economic policy making, more a greater role for supranational institutions, less economic freedom for individual member states of the Eurozone. Uh, and that's, that, that concept of centralizing power in supernatural institutions is not terribly popular with most of the peoples of Europe. Uh, Germany is a good example where I think most of the elite want to do what it takes to save the euro. 
but you know, do the German people go along with that? Um, how will the Dutch vote in their general election in September? How will the Italians vote in their general election a year from now? I don't know. Um, my own view is, and I'm just purely guessing, I have no insight knowledge on this, my, probably Greece cannot stay in the Euro because of this democratic point. I think that the, Greece seems to be in a significantly different picture from position from Portugal or Spain, or indeed Italy or Ireland, in that the, the, the sort of political and social situation in Greece is so inherently unstable that I'm not sure the Greek people can really put up with year after year of relentless austerity and shrinking output. Um, and it does seem very, very difficult to introduce serious structural reforms in Greece. But I mean, that's, I may be wrong about Greece, and I don't claim to know what is best for Greece. I just think there's a, there's a serious question mark about Greece's ability to stay in the Euro, which and I, uh, it may be they should leave, but I wouldn't say that about any other country in, currently in the Eurozone. Secondly, let me think about some of the power shifts in the European Union. Germany up, France down, the Commission sidelined. Well, I think for the first time in the history of the EU, Germany is in charge in a way it's never been in charge before. Um, this comes at a time when uh, Germany is more assertive of its own interests than it's ever been before. I wouldn't say more nationalistic, i just say... It, it no longer believes, as it did when I was a journalist in Brussels 20 years ago, that what is good for Europe is good for Germany and vice versa. There has been a progressive shifting of the German view. Uh, they think that what's good for the majority of member states may not be good for them. This is caused partly by the generational shift. Those who were adult during the Second World War, like Helmut Kohl, have retired. And it's partly because of EU enlargement, bringing a lot of poor countries into the European Union, which has made the Germans see that poor countries coming to the Union want their money and their interests are not necessarily the same. And uh, the, um, I think the, F, the, the, the financial crisis and then the Eurozone crisis have highlighted a feeling in Germany that they want our money and that our partners cannot be trusted. And this has made the Germans uh, less willing to do what their colleagues, their, their partners, wish them to do. And, of course, we have seen over the last five years a big divergence of economic performance between France and Germany in terms of France's share of export markets, its, uh, its public debt, its employment figures. You know, Germany has powered ahead of France, which has led to a real imbalance, which is why Germany is basically in charge these days, as far as I can see, on all the key issues of the Eurozone crisis for the last two years, or most of the key issues, the Germans have got their way. Should there be a new treaty? Nobody wanted it except for the Germans, but there is a new treaty. That's what is one example. Um, now, um, just a few qualifications of what I've said. Firstly, I think the Germans are very reluctant leaders. Um, they don't really like, many Germans don't like the fact that they're leading the EU because with leadership comes responsibility, and some Germans are rather slow to appreciate that leadership does bring responsibility. Uh, you have to think about the other, the other countries in the Union. Certainly in foreign policy, the Germans are not really leaders anyway. Uh, there's been very little, uh, little assertiveness in that area, nor on the economic side. Secondly, more alarmingly, there is a, there is a, I detect a paranoia among some German leaders about Anglo-Saxons. If you talk to people in the, the CDU and the FDP, uh, they really seem to believe there is an Anglo-Saxon conspiracy to undermine the euro, led by The Economist, The Financial Times... Larry Summers, Paul Krugman, uh, leading Anglo-Saxon economists. That they, they really think that we, we, we want the euro to fail, which isn't actually true for most. I mean, even many people in my country, Britain, which is pretty euro-sceptic, and most people in Britain didn't want to join the euro. I did, but I was exceptional. Most people in Britain who didn't want to join the euro still hope the euro survives because they think the economic cost of a breakup would be very great. Um, and the, the other thing I say about the last thing I say about Germany is that, to its credit, there is a real debate in Germany. Although I've talked about Germany as a, an entity, there of course isn't a German view. There's a mainstream German view, but really there are three different German views. There's the Bundesbank view and the FRZ view, which is the view I parodied somewhat, which is austerity and structural reform are all you need to do, and that, and that economics is a branch of moral philosophy. 
and so, and so on, uh, which is that which actually uh, it, it is in, in it is in Germany a branch of moral philosophy, um, and uh, there's that that is that is that is one view. It's the Bundesbank's view, and I, I do believe, and I have some reason to believe that some senior figures in the Bundesbank do not want the euro to survive in its current form. It's not everybody's view in the Bundesbank, I know, but there are, there are factions in the Bundesbank who never wanted the euro to be set up in the first place, and they do not want it to survive. That is not, of course, a mainstream German view. The second school in Germany is the SPD and the Greens and the foreign ministry who, who want the euro to survive, who want Germany to rebalance its own economy uh, and reflate to some degree to create more demand to help people in the rest of Europe. Uh, and they have a sort of, a more, if you like, a more generous view. They think that Germany has a responsibility to save the Eurozone and to put its hand in its pocket. And then the third view is Merkel in the middle, who, as far as I can tell, doesn't uh, have strong views of her own. She's very pragmatic. She's concerned about next month's state election or next week's parliamentary vote and tr sort of pragmatically muddles along, listening to people around her. Um, and ultimately, I, I believe she does want to save the Euro. So I hope that in the long run, and I think it's likely the Germans will do what it takes. Ultimately, <coughs> although Germany's become more assertive in recent years, um, I think that Germans' identity of who they are and what their role in Europe is and what their place in history is, is of a people who are committed to European integration. So even if, in, as in, if I'm right, they don't understand all the economics as perfectly as they should, they, they will do what it takes to save the euro. Very briefly, a word on France, which I've already kind of said quite a lot about it by talking about Germany. Um, I think that not everybody in France is yet aware that France is no longer leading the European Union. Its co-leadership role of the previous uh, 60 years has, has really ended, for now at any rate. Sarkozy's strategy has been to hug the Germans close in the hope of influencing some of the details of EU policy. Um, but I think there is a danger that when the French realise that they are not leading the EU anymore, uh, then they will become significantly more Eurosceptic because the sort of the pro-European case in France has been we are building Europe in France's image. It is uh, a way of enhancing our voice and weight in the world. Uh, I don't know Hollande well. I've met him, but I, I can't say I know him well. Um, and I don't know what he's going to do about the euro and the EU. I think he's, he's somebody who is pro-European without knowing much about it, without being very interested in it. And my guess is he will ratify the fiscal compact, but he will insist on a new growth strategy in Europe, which is you know, the right thing to do, in my view. Um, uh, that sounds fine, but there is also a risk that he may pursue policies on debt and borrowing, which are seen by the markets as not serious. Uh, and there is a, perhaps a danger that he, that he may do in two months what Mitterrand did in two years between 1981 and 1983, when he basically tried to reflate in one country until the market stopped him and Helmut Kohl and Jacques Delors persuaded him to, to do a U-turn. Um, these days, markets move quicker than they did uh, 30 years ago. Um, and I just don't know. I mean, if, if he appoints people like Michel Sapin, former finance minister, and Jean-Pierre Jouillet, uh, who used to work for Jacques Delors, as, as his sort of key prime ministers, finance ministers, advisors, then we can expect the moderate economic policies, uh, fiscal restraint. That, that's fine. But if he sort of is serious about attacking finance capitalism, which he said he will do, and follows a kind of hard left agenda around the <laughs> financial markets and thinks he could ignore them, as he said he wants to tame the markets, if he really thinks he can do that, um, then France is going to be in trouble pretty quickly. Um, and so, you know, we, we'll just wait and we'll wait and we'll see. But, I mean, the good news about Hollande, if he wins, is that I think he will get everybody to sign up to a growth strategy. The European Commission. Well, one of the significant long-term trends is that the Commission is losing power, authority and influence. It has been doing so for over 20 years. Uh, it, in the days of Jacques Delors, it overbid, it became too high and mighty, and ever since, the member states have been trying to win powers back, particularly the larger member states, particularly France and Germany. And in the last few years, I've been truly shocked to hear the kind of rhetoric about the Commission in the Elysee and in the Chancellery in Germany. They're very much ruder about it, even than British Eurosceptics are. 
Um, I mean, the French criticize it for being an agent of Anglo-Saxon liberalism, but also for not understanding the need to foster new technologies and protect European industries and, uh, and, and apply tougher reciprocity-orientated trade policies and so on. The Germans just complain that it's always trying to tell them uh, to sort out their, their landers' banks and reduce their state aid and so on. But um, part of the Commission's weakness now is its own fault. I mean, it does tend to focus on the wrong priorities sometimes. It, you know, asking for you know, pay rise, big pay rises for its staff last year wasn't terribly clever PR. The quality of commissioners is, is pretty low, to be honest, compared with how it used to be. Um, leadership seems weak, easily buffeted by, by the winds. But much of the criticism is unfair. Much of the criticism is simply because the Commission is doing its job of policing the market and forcing competition policy. Um, uh, and we've seen the Commission sidelined in the creation of the new bailout mechanisms. In the Fiscal Compact Treaty, it is true, the Commission has been given a significant role uh, in the policing the, the new treaty. And in the so-called six-pack uh, arrangements, also the Commission has a role in, in enforcing fiscal discipline. I suppose what I'd say is that the, the legal powers and competences of the Commission have grown, but its authority, its credibility, its real power has diminished because member states, particularly the large ones, are so hostile to it. I think this matters because uh, the Commission is the body that cares about the single market. It is the body that stands up for the small countries and prevents the creation of a of a very gaullist Europe, and it does consider the wider European interest. Uh, without the Commission, would we have had energy security and climate change put on the EU's agenda as we have in the last few years? So I, I lament the weakness of the Commission, even though I think it's partly self-inflicted, only partly. Uh, finally, let me say a few words about Britain on the way out. My own view is, as somebody who wishes Britain to stay, to play a, a strong role in the EU, my own view is that there's probably a 50% chance that Britain will leave the European Union in the next 10 years. Um, the December the 9th summit, when Britain famously did not sign up to the fiscal compact, is not in itself proved, proved hugely damaging yet. Uh, there has been an effort to reach out to the British and engage them via many of our partners. And the actual final text of the fiscal compact was a defeat for Sarkozy, who tried to create a very intergovernmentalist fiscal compact with a, a small role for the Commission, a new, a new economic club that could talk about any kind of economic policy, including the single market. And thanks to the Germans and others, those ideas were shot down, as I said before, the Commission plays a big role in the compact, which is in the British interest, of course, because the Commission will try and uh, preserve the single market. Though, of course, people in Britain got this muddled up and they seem to think that the Commission being involved was bad for British interests. But they don't, not everybody in the Tory party understands that the Commission, for its faults, is trying to help the market. Uh, so in the short term, not too much damage done. In the long term, um, I think the Eurozone crisis is going to increase the gap between Britain and the rest of the European Union because we're going to see a politically integrating Eurozone core of the EU, which is not congenial for the British. We have always thought of the EU as basically an economic club, as a single market with a few bits added on. And the more it becomes a political union, the less we like it, even if, as is the case with the fiscal compact, we're not directly affected by the centralization of budgetary policy. Um, I think the creation of a, of a Eurozone core, as the Germans now say, a political union, will lead to pressure in Britain for a referendum. Uh, because um, even though technically the, ref the EU Act of 2011, which says there should be a referendum if any new treaties transfer powers to the EU, technically the provisions of that Act would not necessitate a referendum if the Eurozone core integrates because it doesn't transfer powers from Britain to the EU. In practice, it will lead to such pressure because the sceptics in Britain will argue that the nature of the EU is changing, its character is changing. It's a different kind of club, not the kind of club we voted on in 1975 in our referendum on EU membership then. Um, so what really matters for Britain's uh, position in the EU at the moment is the state of the Conservative Party. And the Tory party is split between Eurosceptics who want to stay in the EU, which is 
George Osborne and David Cameron, and probably William Hague, and the Eurosceptics who want to leave the EU, which is a majority of Tory party members, and probably at least half the backbenchers in the House of Commons. Um, and uh, I think the, it is, I think that, th although I think the Tory party is absolutely crucial, and although, as I said, David Cameron doesn't want to pull out, and therefore he doesn't want a referendum, he'd be opposed to a referendum on membership because the referendum would split the Tory party and be a distraction from other more important business. I do think there's a risk that future generations of Tory leaders may well have a different view on a referendum. Boris Johnson, who could well be a candidate to replace David Cameron, he's the mayor of London at the moment, he wants a referendum on EU membership, for example. He's a populist, and uh, anyone standing for the leadership of the Tory party would probably have to offer a referendum to members in order to get those members to vote for them as leader. I mean, it's as simple as that, uh, I fear. Um, to be fair to the Tory party, the Tory party itself is just reflecting a shift of public opinion in Britain on the EU. Uh, even if its m Tory party members feel, feel their Euroscepticism more strongly than the British people as a whole, the British people have become more Eurosceptic. Last year, for the first time in British history, that at least in, that I'm aware of, a clear, a clear majority of <coughs> British people said that they would support leaving the EU. Until a year ago, it was about 50-50. Now it's uh, 60, 40 in favour of leaving. Now, why is this? Well, of course, the obvious reason, the main reason for the shift is the Eurozone crisis. It, it's very bad PR for the EU. EU leaders are seen to be incompetent. One emergency summit after another fails to solve the Eurozone's problems. Do we really want to be part of a club run by incompetent people? And that's, that's part of it. Um, the Eurosceptics have developed a new narrative it used to be the EU is an overweening super state that will take away British sovereignty. The EU is all powerful. That narrative doesn't work very well because the EU is so obviously weak and pathetic rather than all powerful. So the new narrative is this. The new narrative is Britain is an inherently dynamic entrepreneurial nation. This huge great European millstone around our neck is weighing us down, holding us back. Red tape from Brussels, bureaucracy, slow-moving, stagnant economies. We need to free ourselves from the shackles of, of slow-moving continental Europe and hitch on to the, the dynamic BRICS economies. Well, that's nice in theory until you look at the trade figures. 7% of British exports... <laughs> sorry, sorry, got too excited. 7% of British exports went to the BRICS... Uh, the, the, well, the, the, the four BRICS, not the five BRICS, the four BRICS, but Brazil, Russia, India and China uh, last year. Uh, and, of course, as many people like to say in Britain, pro-Europeans like to say that Britain exports more to Ireland than all the BRICs put together, which is technically true, but I gather that quite a lot of those exports are then re-exported elsewhere, so it's a slightly, perhaps a slightly misleading figure. So that's the new narrative. Uh, another factor affecting British views of Europe is Michel Barnier, the single market commissioner, who is a very controversial figure in Britain because he doesn't really believe in deepening the single market. He's personally opposed to liberalising services industries because why? He was the man in France who led the referendum campaign on the Constitutional Treaty in 2005. The reason why the Yes campaign was defeated in 2005 was the fear of the Polish plumber. It was all about the liberalisation of services in the Bolkestein Directive. So he's personally stunned by that and he's doing everything he can to make sure there's no more liberalisation of services, though most serious economists that I know think that that would be the best way to create jobs in Europe. Equally, he's not doing a hell of a lot to liberalise the digital economy either. And on the City of London, uh, he is uh, coming up with rules and regulations, some of which appear to be very damaging to the city, and the British, you know, watering some of these down, but not all of them down necessarily. Uh, he's also in favour of the financial transaction tax, as is as are the French and German governments. If implemented, uh, a financial transaction tax would probably destroy a lot of the trading business in the city of London. It would go to uh, Hong Kong or New York or Singapore. So such factors are one reason why the sort of financial elite in Britain are becoming more Eurosceptical, even though, to be fair, uh, to Barney, of course, his views on the city of London, which are perhaps quite hostile, are probably no different from those of many British people who do blame the city for a lot of their economic problems. But my point is that he's alienating some of the sort of political and financial elite with these, with these measures. Migration is another 
issue that has really made the British more Eurosceptic. As, as, as you know in Ireland, we, you and the Swedes were the only people to open our borders in 2004. Probably a million and a half Central Europeans came to Britain, uh, didn't push up unemployment at all. It probably did push down wages for unskilled labour. And basically, it's a class divide. Middle class people thought it was great, but people in labouring jobs in Britain didn't think it was great and are pretty unhappy about this, and they blamed the EU for the surge of immigration. And um, uh, fi an another, 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 another factor uh, pushing the Eurosceptics, helping them, is that they have some very effective lobbying groups. There's a group called Open Europe, which is well-funded, quite efficient, publishing some quite serious work. They send a sort of daily briefing to MPs telling them all the wicked things that he was doing. And there isn't any equivalent pro-European organisation. This is because British businesses don't really see the risk of us leaving the EU. They're rather apolitical anyway, and I haven't yet managed to persuade many business leaders to put millions of pounds into a new pro-European lobby. I'm still trying, but I haven't succeeded. Um, a footnote on Scotland. I, my own view is that Britain is more likely to leave the EU than Scotland is to leave Britain. And indeed, the, that's what opinion polls suggest. But if... Scotland was to leave Britain, and Britain's still in the EU, then uh, Britain is more likely to leave the EU as a result, because without the Scots, you'd have a built-in Conservative government almost all the time in, in, in what's left of Britain, and the chances of a referendum would be greater, and the chances of a referendum to leave the EU passing would be greater without the Scots, who are a little bit more pro-European than the English. I wouldn't say a lot, but a little bit more pro-European. Conversely, if... Uh, if Britain, Britain with Scotland leaves the EU, then Scotland would be more likely to leave Britain, because I think the Scottish people would not want to be part of a Britain that left the EU. Anyway, so. Uh, finally, my, my, my last, my last uh, couple of sentences, and I'll stop, on what should the British government do? I mean, you're not the British government, but if you were the British government, this is what I would say. Uh, and not just the British government, but what should, what should pro-Europeans do? Well, clearly one thing, we need to get businesses in Britain to speak out. Uh, and explain that they think we get more FDI in Britain because of membership of the EU. We need to get trade unions to speak out. Most of them support membership, but for, for reasons I don't entirely understand, they're very quiet and they don't say anything about the EU, except that they welcome maternity leave and uh, the, the agency workers' directive and the working time directive. They welcome these EU directives, but they don't really say anything about the EU. Uh, and we need more responsible politicians. I mean, for sort of for decades now, Politicians, including those in the Labour Party, have been those who are quite pro-European don't like to admit this in public because it's 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 a way of losing votes, as simple as that. All the focus groups show that pro-European policies don't win support. So even though the Liberal Party are well known to be pro-European and they're in government, they never say they never say this in public. Nick Clegg has never give, given a speech on the merits of EU membership because his his media advisors were told not to do it. So you have a very un, you have a very kind of you have a, a tilted playing field where the, the anti-Europeans make a lot of noise and the pro-Europeans keep quiet for fear of losing votes. So that that's this can't, if this goes on, we'll be out. So that's why people like Ed Miliband, who I believe is pro-European but not very interested in Europe, people like him are gonna have to start speaking out. And even Tory ministers are gonna have to speak out too when the EU does things that that are credit to its credit, such as um, a successful process of enforcing an oil embargo against Iran or sanctions against Syria or helping with democratization in Burma or a, a trade agreement with South Korea or negotiating peace between Serbia and Kosovo. When the EU does good things, British ministers need to say this. And even, even on a good day, we might persuade William Hague to try and say these things, which I think he, do, he does, to his credit, acknowledge that the EU has a role to play in some foreign policy issues, but he doesn't yet make speeches saying the good things that the EU does in these areas. So what the British government should do is change its rhetoric, have a more positive rhetoric about the European Union. It should come up with some positive ideas on the future of the EU, not just the single market, which you expect from the Brits, and not just enlargement, which is frankly dead. Perhaps in areas such as the neighbourhood policy, defence, energy, climate, Britain can contribute. And then the British government needs to build alliances. We've been very bad at doing this. Um, I suppose, to, be, to their credit, both Gordon Brown and David Cameron have made a fair effort to have good relationships with France and Germany. That's sensible. 
but they've ignored the little countries. Most EU countries are little countries. And if you go to Denmark or the Netherlands, you find, or many Central European countries, you find governments who say, we'd love to be close to the British. We'd love to work with the British on this issue or that issue. But we never see them. We always have French ministers passing through, French officials. But where are the British ministers? British ministers don't make time to travel to other smaller European countries. Not very often, not sufficiently often, nor do senior officials. And uh, we don't invest enough in building relationships. I mean, the, pr the prime example of this is Poland. When Poland joined the EU, it was a British ally, a British friend. We helped get it into the EU. Now there is almost no link between Britain and Poland. Poland has fallen into the Franco-German sphere of influence, partly because of they find our Eurosceptic policies very difficult to stomach, but partly because we just didn't invest in the relationship. We haven't cultivated politicians in Poland, made visits to them. That's just one example. So I think if we had positive policies built alliances, then the current government, even the current government, could show the British people that the EU works to the British people's advantage and it doesn't always work against us to our disadvantage. Most British people see it as working to our disadvantage. They see it as something driven by France and Germany and the Brussels bureaucrats against British interests. And the British political elite, helped by businesses and trade unions, need to try and change that perception. And if they don't, we're out. Thank you. Thank you.